So this is a very um, sort of overview na lecture and medyo nahiya ko to sa mga BS Physics dito kasi walang physics masyado dito na i-discuss ako. Baka ma-bore kayo tapos lumayas na na kayo sa door. So sorry ha, um, kasi hindi rin ako nabigyan ng profile kung anong type ng crowd yung a-attend. Like um, general courses ba? Or um, matter, yung... universe? The sun and its power, the planets in our own solar system, new exoplanets, tsaka yung mga weirdos. Tapos yung iba pang mga strange things sa universe. So we will go on to this one by one. Next slide please. So it all started with a bang. Sa ba? So inisip nyo ba yung big bang nag-start sa isang bang na nasa, na isang malaking bang sa isang point in time? Because if you think Big Bang that way, it's, it's not that way. The explosion happened everywhere in one moment of time. So yun ang tatandaan nyo, it happened in every, in every space, in every moment, in, in every place in space, in one moment in time. So, dyan na rin na create yung fabric ng universe. Which we don't know kung ano talaga actually. Next slide, please. So, nung nag-start yung Big Bang na yun, alam natin na it came from a singular point na tinatawag na lang singularity, which is highly symmetrical daw na hindi nila alam kung object o moment, which is lahat ng forces during that time is still intact and um, compressed in one point. So, after the bang, um, nag-separate yung mga forces na yun, which are the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravity. So, kung makikita nyo yung timeline ng Big Bang is, it happened so fast na 10 to the negative 43 seconds, 10 to the 35 fraction of a second lang. And then, we are here now, 13.7 billion years ago, having galaxies, connecting to Wi-Fi and everything. So, it's amazing how how these things or how we are how we came to be right now. So, paki transfer po please. Yon, ano ba yung mga fundamental forces in nature? Syempre, kabisado na to ng mga BS physics, bawal na sumagot. Strong nuclear force that holds the nuclear the nuclear particles together which means yung proton and neutron na nasa yon. And then yung, weak, nasa atom, then yung weak nuclear force, which is responsible for the radioactive decay. Then the electromagnetic force, which holds electrons to the nuclei. Medyo dito ako, ano eh, I was supposed to give you prebiotic chemistry lecture, kaya lang, baka hindi naman lahat makaka-relate, no? So, then we have the gravitational force, which holds matter together into large structure. May, later, iti-discuss natin yung iba dyan. Next slide, please. So, ito yung um, scale ng universe. Um, medyo malabo lang to, no? Pero during dito nung, nung um, part na kakasabog lang ng bang, um, ito yung mga particles na present. So, sinabi na meron dito mga proton and neutron, a proton and, and electron during this time, na nag-combine hanggang maging malalaking, mas malalaking particles na nag-form ng mga simpleng um, nucleotides eventually tapos na-translate sa formation ng mas malalaking atoms hanggang sa mapunta tayo sa era ng galaxy which is right now na ino-observe natin. So how likely to be, i-discuss ko later part ng slides. So yun lang, gusto ko lang makita niyo yung overview ng transition na pwedeng may magtanong dyan na ano, do we really came from ano, nothing? or from something that that is not alive. So that is very debatable, diba? So next slide, please. Yan, medyo malabo kasi mariwanag pa rin po eh. So itong growth structure ng universe, sinasabi dito sa mga picture na to, um, during the first few seconds, medyo compressed pa yung universe itself na wala kang makikita mga spaces. And then, after some time or after a few seconds, cold matter, which is yung 26, uh, 24, 26% part ng universe, 
um, acted upon dun sa galaxies na yon. And then, naghiwahiwalay sila ng konti to form superclusters of galaxies. Kasi gravity continues to pull clusters together during that time. But at the same time, dito makikita nyo medyo may space, dark energy na yung nag act Kasi medyo naa-accelerate na niya yung naa-accelerate na niya yung pinaka-universe natin. Actually, yung dark energy, yung parang fuel dun sa acceleration ng universe. Next slide, please. So, ito yung sinasabing composition ng universe natin. Um, 4% yung visible tsaka yung matter na nakikita natin. While the 23% yung dark matter, then 73% yung dark energy. Next slide, please. What are those things? Dark matter are the undetected form of mass that emits little or no photons, but we know it must exist because we observe the effects of it through gravity. Then, yung dark energy naman is an unknown form of energy that is causing the universe to expand faster over time. Let me explain yung effects ng dark matter. So, ito yung tinatawag na gravitational lensing. Um, isa pa. Yan. Yeah. Um, think of it na meron tayong hinahanap na isang object dito sa likod nitong galaxy na to. Yan yung gravity. Ito yung think of the universe as a one big lens na pwede natin magamit sa observation. For say, for example, we're looking at this object. So, dahil malayo ito at nauuna itong batch ng galaxy na to, Parang nakikita natin na nag na, na, na curve yung nakikurb yung itsura niya dahil dito sa heavy massive galaxy na nasa harapan collection ng galaxy na nasa harapan niya. Medyo nakikurb dito yung image sa mata natin. Pakibalik mo dun sa isang slide. Bakit nakikurb? 'Di ba dun sa theory of ano, general relativity? na nakikurb yung space-time kapag merong heavy na object na nandoon. So, kapag tinitingnan mo yung isang bagay, tapos obstructed siya ng isang heavy na object, let's say, for example, dito, a collection of galaxy, yung image sa'yo, nagle-lens siya dito. Medyo nakikurb siya. Kasi ang perception mo dito, yung light kasi na galing dito sa hinahanap mong object, na, na nawa-warp niya dito sa edges. So, pag na-warp niya dito sa edge dahil mabigat nga siya, ang tingin mo, nagbibilog yung image. Pakibalik mo ulit. Kasi kung ito, hindi siya ganun ka-heavy, yung, yung light sana na nakikita mo from that object, dapat straight lang. So, halimbawa, si Hernan. Pag tinignan ko si Hernan, tapos merong nakablock dito na malaking-malaking galaxy, Makikita ko si Herna na bumibilog siya. Parang nagiging fish eye yung effect. So, yun yun na. Remember, ang theory na nag-involved uh, sa explanation nun is yung theory of general relativity wherein space is curved kapag may massive object na nandun. Slide, please. So, ganyan yun. So, si space is not an empty void but rather a dynamical structure whose shape is determined by the presence of matter and energy. Now, matter tells space how to curve, while the space tells matter how to move. Okay? So, masaya sana dito, discuss natin yung mga physics ng mga wormhole o kaya yung physics ng, ng Star Trek travel na ginagamit nila yung mga negative energy drive para makarating sa, inter, sa mga galaxy sa ibang lugar. So, but para skip natin, tsaka nilang paghinanap ng pagkakataon later. So, ito yung theory, no, theory, uh, general theory of relativity na Einstein na nandiyad-describe ng curvature ng space, which is yon given dito. Tapos yung TUV naman describes the matter and energy. So, sino mag-explain ito? Mga taga, ano, <laughs> TUV na physics. I challenge you. Kasi ako hindi ko kaya eh. <laughs> ano? Pass? Next slide, Rao. <laughs> In this norm. Sige, basta yun. Ito 
lang naman yung basis kung paano kung paano kung paano niya ina-explain yung curvature ng space dahil sa effect ng mass. Okay? Next slide please. So, paano ba natin nalaman na nag expand yung universe? Actually, si Habo lang nakakuha ng credit, pero kay Einstein pa lang, na-realize na, na niya na nag expand yung universe. But the thing is, um, hindi niya pinaniwalaan yung assumption niya eh. Tapos ang ginawa niya, nag-insert siya ng cosmological constant para raw maging static yung universe. Eh, it's not the way, it's not the way, di ba? Um, nung na-discover ni Edwin, ni Edwin Hubble na yung galaxy talaga is receding away from us through the observation, tapos yung, yung parang Doppler effect na nare-redship yung mga galaxies kasi umaalis or lumalayo sa atin, then nag-blue ship naman siya pag lumalapit, pag pagpapalapit sa atin. So, doon niya nalaman na, na, na expanding talaga yung universe. So, yun na nga, na-postulate na yung Hubble's, yung Hubble's law na merong certain velocity and merong Hubble's constant pa nga. Next slide, please. So, ito yung ibig sabihin ng Doppler ship na yun. Let's say, for example, ito alam na alam ng mga physics major ko eh. Merong ambulance na alam mo pagpapalapit siya sa'yo, di ba lumalakas yung sound niya. Pero pag lumalayo siya sa'yo, lumiliit, kumihina yung sound niya. Ito naman, in In, in a visual way. So, kapag ka lumalapit sa'yo yung isang bagay, you tend to see it na medyo bluish in color. Pero pag lumalayo sa'yo yung isang bagay, pag nag-observe ka, medyo nagre-red ship siya in color. So, if you get to see sa mga telescopes or dun sa mga like, theoretically, kaya nyong sumilip sa isang powerful telescope, the more na mas malayo yung hinahanap nyo, makikita nyo sa perception nyo, na yung object is slightly red. Ibig sabihin, lumalayo siya sa'yo at the point ng observation mo. Okay? Next slide, please. So, ano ba yung feature ng universe natin? So, may mga kinumpit na sila dyan ng mga, ano eh, um, uh, may mga idea na sila kung paano mag-e-end ng universe. Like, sinabi nila that our universe will continue accelerating and then we'll, we will end up na marilip apart. Pero sabi rin nila, probably hindi, we are in a critical universe na stable lang siya na ganun. So, actually, the density ng ordinary matter sa universe ang magde-dictate nun. At saka yung, yung, yung pag-take over ng gravity. If the universe contain much more matter, it would have collapsed back on itself, which is not happening. Then, if the universe had contained much less matter, it would have expanded forever, but probably never formed stars. So, hindi rin naman doon. So, ang sabi, it's like accelerating ngayon and our universe is flat and not static. Okay? Next slide, please. Punta naman tayo sa solar system. Ito, alam ko, medyo alam niyo na to. Kaya, hindi ko na i-discuss yung mga usual facts ng mga planets na nasa solar system but kung ano yung kakaiba sa kanila. Let's go to the sun muna. So, sun is a star, right? ba? Diba? So, sun accounts for the 99.8% ng mass ng solar system. Yung 0.2% na natitirang mass, yun yung para sa mga planet in between. So, siya talaga ang weight ng buong solar system natin. Kaya, sa kanya tayo nakadepend. So, makikita nyo rito is the part, parts ng sun, wherein merong ka-activities na yan. So, you wonder, ano ba yung ano ba yung nasa sun? O alam nyo naman na may core siya, na merong nag-active na, nag-fuse na hydrogen and, and, and helium atoms dyan. And then, do you know that the sun rotates? It rotates, pero not like a rigid sphere. Naunang mag-rotate yung sa equator part niya, kesa yung nandito sa poles. So, hindi siya katulad ng planet natin na nag-rotate na isang buo medyo nauuna tong nasa gitna. So that brings about yung solar dynamics, yung kung bakit may kung bakit merong activity sa surface, kung bakit may solar wind parang sa planet natin. Kung hindi naman tayo nagro-rotate, wala namang mga wind, walang wind, 'di ba? So sa sun ganun din. So kung makikita nyo, kaya yung activities ng sun mostly nandito sa portion na to eh. 
Nandito sa mid, mid portion na yan. Later, di-discuss ko anong difference ng mga mga players and CME. So, di ba may recent news na yung CME daw will be hitting early now in like three days. Lumabas yung news mga September 8. And then, parang it hit early ng September 12. Tapos, nagkaroon ng mga text, mga text, ano, brigade na turn off the cellphone daw kasi maapektuhan daw, may solar player daw na galing sa Mars. Parang, what the hell? Solar player nga, tas galing sa Mars, di ba? Solar nga eh. Tapos, parang, di ba, tas sobrang galing po naman yung mga nagpo-forward. So, parang gusto mong ibato yung cellphone sa kanila. No? Anyway, yun yung dapat na i-correct. I-correct natin yung mga perception na yun. Kasi, Pumasok mami ko sa kwarto ko para patayin mo lahat ng ano ng gadget, patayin mo cellphone mo, ganyan ganyan. Patayin mo TV tsaka yung BSL. Bakit? Solar flare daw galing ng Mars. Ano? Space palma ko sa mami ko noon. Gusto ko magkulong ng tatlong araw. Okay, kasi wala nang pagka naman pagka naman ni lecture ako siya, wala naman siya guys. Sabi no, sabi sa kanon, ay nako kumain ka na nga. Okay. So, this case is me next tayo. Ano ang difference ng solar flare at CME na lagi niyong naririnig? Yung solar flare, pag tinignan mo yung surface ng sun, meron mga miniature na burst dun eh. Yung mga burst na yun, mga gamma ray burst yun. Pag nag-burst yun, galing sa activity ng mismong surface, it will really hit Earth inta instantaneously. Like mga 8 minutes. Siyempre magka-travel pa siya, di ba? Pero yung cosmic Coronal Mass Ejections or CME, malalaking bubbles ng gas ito na threaded ng magnetic field. Ito yung nagdi-disrupt ng solar wind. Tapos, this thing reaches us in 3 days pa. Kasi particles yan eh. Hindi lang siya, clouds of particles siya, hindi lang siya parang, parang, hindi uh, ko ma-explain kung ano yung, yung flares, ano? Yung nature ng flares kasi it's parang, hindi siya particle, pero parang siyang particle. May rin explain. Parang halo or something like that. Kaya it, it reaches out to you like a, like a normal light. Pero ang CME kasi is um, particle rich. Cloud siya actually, isang cloud. Kaya nagtatravel siya medyo matagal because may mass. Kaya it will reach us in 3 days pa. Ngayon, ito yung kapag malalaki at saka naka-direct sa Earth, Potentially, catastrophic talaga kapag sinira niya lahat ng mga satellite systems natin, which we are very dependent on, di ba? Next slide, please. So, ano naman yung difference ng corona and solar wind? Itong nakikita niya yan, corona yan. And sabi nila, corona is forever expanding into interplanetary space, filling the solar system with a constant flow of solar wind. Now, yung solar wind naman, ito yung continuous flow ng charged particles ayon sa electrons and neutrons that come from the sun in every direction. So, yan. Ang hmm. um, solar wind varies from less than 300 kilometers per second to over 800 kilometers per second. Ang solar wind, yun nga, pakidalik natin doon sa ano nung sun, picture ng sun. Yan. Ito yung corona na sinasabi niya. Itong nakikita niyo parang parang red halo dyan. Yan yung corona. And then yung solar wind naman, it's like yung, syempre sabi ko nga sa inyo, nagro-rotate yung sun. It's, yung, it's the effect of that rotation and then natatransmit lang papunta sa atin. Hindi rin naman siya flare, kasi ang flare, eto yun eh, mga sudden burst. Hindi rin naman siya flare. Pero it's like, it's like an ordinary effect. Parang, parang atmospheric effect. Pero sa sun lang siya. Pero yun, na-experience na, 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 na pa rin natin yun. So, bakit? Pagka na-experience natin yung presence yung mga particles ito at saka mga cosmic rays, ano man yung nangyayari sa atin? So, pakilipat mo sa ano, mga next few slides. Isa pa. Yan. So, yung aurora. Which is nakikita sa dalawang part. Uh, sa northern yung... Pag sa northern part, you call it aurora borealis. Kapag south... Aurora Australis. Pero it doesn't only happen minsan sa Australia. Minsan daw may nakikita sa Japan eh. Parang very amazing. No? So yun. Pero we should not wish na sana pagkaroon ng Aurora dito sa atin. Kasi katapusan na natin yun. 
Okay, why, why dun lang dun sa mga malapit sa post nangyayari yung Aurora? Next slide, please. Yan. Kasi andito yung ano eh, nandito yung pinaka-weakest point nitong magnetosphere. Yung magnetosphere natin, saan ba galing yun? Kaya tayo may magnetosphere na nagpo-protect sa atin sa cosmic rays is because meron tayong liquid core na very active at umiikot sa loob ng mundo. Yung umiikot na yun, parang nagsisilbi siyang dynamo para magkaroon ng magnetic field yung buong Earth. Kaya, pag huminto na yung ikot ng liquid core sa loob ng planet, patay na tayo doon kasi hihina itong mag magnetic sphere na to na nagpo-protect sa atin sa sun. So, since na dito yung weakest, weakest point ng protection, um, dito nakaka-escape pumasok yung mga cosmic rays na galing sa sun. So, pag dito, makikita nyo dyan yung aurora borealis, pag dito yung aurora australis. So, next slide please. So, tanda tayo dun sa mga planets. Okay, next slide. So, si Mercury, wala na akong sasabihin sa kanya, aside from alam nyo naman kung nasan siya naka-place, no? Um, very extreme nga lang yung ano niya. Very extreme yung temperature sa kanya, which is 450 degrees at day, pero negative 178, 170 at night. And then, one thing is, Mercury is geologically dead. Ibig sabihin, hindi na-active yung planet kasi sobrang solid ng core niya. So, wala kang mapapalang mga, uh, mga activity dito sa planet na to. Next slide, please. So, si Venus, aside from, akala natin maganda siya, pero ganito yung itsura niya. Because, sobrang init sa Venus. Ang surface temp niya is more than 465 degrees which is enough to melt the lead. Kaya, scorching hot dito and then punong-puno ng volcanic activities. Um, aside from that, masarap mag-take ng absent or leave sa Venus ng isang araw. Kasi, yung isang araw niya, mas mahaba sa isang taon niya. Paano nangyari yun? Kasi yung ikot ng, ng Venus sa axis niya, super slow, which takes about 243 days bago niya matapos ang isang araw. Pero, pag nag-rotate naman siya sa sun, mas mabilis, 224 days. Nag-gets nyo? Yes. Ha? Na lang ikot ng, ikot ng mundo ng Venus. Okay. Bakit pa natin gustong-gustong pumunta sa Mars? Meron pang nangangarap na may tumititira sa Mars, pero it's really impossible naman talaga, di ba? First of all, Mars is almost geologically dead. Yung core niya, wala ng activity. Before, meron. Kaya nga before, nakakreate pa siya ng vulkan, which is the largest volcano in the solar system called the Olympus Mons. Itong Olympus Mons na to, sobrang laki niya kasi laki siya ng Pilipinas, which is about the size ng state ng Arizona. At ang height niya is times 3 ng sa Everest. Bakit, bakit siya lumaki ng gano'n tsaka tumaas ng gano'n? Kasi sa Mars, di ba, parang one-third lang or one-fifth lang yung gravity from our, from our, for, ano, reference point. So, ano pa ba ang feature ng Mars? Itong mga polar caps na to, before, inisip nila na solid, na ano to, na ice, na solid ice tong mga nasa polar caps, pero hindi. Those caps are solid um, carbon dioxide. So, ano pa ba ang meron sa Mars? Yung Valles Marineris, yung pinaka-deep naman daw na portion ng Mars, which is about 25 kilometers. So, kung sa atin yun, na-drill mo na yung buong core natin, ay yung buong crust. Yun yung deep, ganun ka-deep yung body sa Mars. So, extreme talaga dito. May highs and lows, di ba? Okay. So, next slide, please. Si Jupiter naman, Wala namang ano dyan, alam na natin na may marami siyang moon. Meron siyang 63 na moon and then yung great spot. Yung great red spot is a 300-year-old hurricane. So, ito yung longest running uh, hurricane sa buong solar system at 300 years old in the making and counting. Next slide, please. So, ipipicture ko lang itong dalawang Galilean moon. Itong Ayo, yung pinakamalapit na, na moon sa Jupiter, 
Isa sa pinakamalalak, malapit. This one is very active. As in, um, maliliit lang ang spacing ng mga volcanoes dyan. So, maya't maya pumubutok yan, mga volcanoes sa ayo. While sa Europa naman, is said to be very promising kasi etong surface niyan is um, solid draw na ice. So, tinitheorize ng mga scientists na beneath that is, a, is an ocean, actually, na may water. So, medyo tinitingnan yung possibility dito na may may expect silang uh, life forms. Next slide, please. Saturn, aside from the wonderful wonderful ring system, ang pinaka-curious thing sa Saturn yung nasa ilalim niya eh. It is called the hexagon. So, they, they, they don't know actually kung ano yung hexagon na nasa ilalim ng ng Saturn eh. But they think na meron daw ditong pressure gradient, pressure and temperature gradient na nagkikreate nitong image na to. So hanggang ngayon, curious pa rin yung mga scientists kung ano yung hexagon na yan. Next slide please. Venus. Which is very weird kasi nagtitilt siya. 98 degrees nung ano niya. So, literally, it is spinning on its side. Spinning on its side. So, ano nangyayari dyan pag ganun? 42 years ka lang naman may araw, tapos 42 years na gabi. So, ganun, ganun naman ka weird dito sa Uranus. So, siguro mga on the 43rd year, lipat ka na uli ng planet kasi gabi na dun. So, ganun siya. Okay, and then, next slide please. Neptune. Ano naman ang nasa Neptune? Yung Neptune, pag nakita nyo yung image niya, is medyo bluish. Pero actually, ang um, composition daw ng atmosphere niyan is methane. So, yung methane kasi absorbs most of the red red EMR sa spectrum. Kaya ang na nakikita natin is blue, blue, blue color. Pero actually, hindi nga nila alam kung talag talagang to control blue nga talaga si Neptune. Ang, na, ang one thing naman kay Neptune is napakabilis niya. Siya yung may fastest planetary winds at 1,500 miles per hour. So, bakit ganun? Kahit na ang layo-layo na niya sa sun, bakit ang bilis niyang umikot? Di ba? Dapat hindi ganun. Dapat as well, bilis niyang umikot pagka mas malapit siya. So, yun yung weird na sa kanya na dinidiscover. So, among dyan sa lahat ng planets na yan, lahat yan nakapag-send na tayo ng probes, except dun sa one, sa Pluto, na dinemote natin noong 2006. Next slide, please. So, ito yung mga, since na-demote siya, tinawag na lang siya na trans-Neptunian object, or objects after Neptune, or dwarf planet. So, sino ba yung may kagagawa talaga kung bakit na-demote si Pluto? Discovery ni Eris. Itong si Eris, nung nakita nila noong 2005, 2006, na-realize nila na nag-orbit within sa orbit ng Pluto. So, ano ba yung classifications para masabi natin planet yung isang planet? Pakilipat mo sa isang slide. Na dapat, it orbits around the sun, di ba? Pangalawa, may sufficient mass for itself gravity to overcome rigid body forces para ma-assume niya na round shape siya. Round naman si Pluto. Nag-orbit naman siya sa sun. Pero dapat, it will clear the neighborhood around its orbit. Which, hindi nagawa ni Pluto. Kaya siya dinemote na dwarf planet. Kasi, imagine mo, balik mo po sa last slide. Kung pinabayaan mo yon, di kailangan i-register mo na to ng new planets. Tapos, marami pa yon. So, siguro, mas madali sa kanilang ganun. Mas convenient tayo. Sige, demote na lang kaysa i-rename natin to na maging mga planets. Okay? So, do you have questions so far? Ha? Marami? Okay, science. Go tayo sa natin. How do we study ba para makakita or makahanap ng extrasolar planets? Actually, medyo trending ngayon yung paghanap ng extrasolar planets. Eh. Okay? For one, ito yung mga method, yung transits, radial velocity of planets, at saka direct imaging. Next slide, please. Ano ba nangyayari pag transit? Itong kuha na to, kuha natin to sa Manila Observatory last 
2012 na Venus Transit using yung solar scope natin. So, ito si Venus. Ito si Sun. So, ano ba ang kinukuha pag transit? Actually, ang, mag, ang talagang indicator at ma, makukuha mong information kapag nag-o-observe ka ng transit between, two, between a planet and a star is yung ratio ng size. So, syempre, mag, mag, makukorelate mo na pag small lang yung object obscuring the star, maliit lang yung planet. Tapos, um, itong estimation ng ratio na yan, hindi lang naman yan direct eh. Parang gumagamit pa sila ng ibang methods on how to account for the size and the proper proper shape nitong object na to. So, iyan lang yung isa sa example kung paano nakakahanap yung mga scientist ng extrasolar planet. Hahanap sila ng isang star, tapos titignan nila kung meron nag-obstruct doon every once in a while. Yun. Ito yung tinatawag nating Doppler spectroscopy. Ano bang ginagawa ng, ng, ng method na to? Ina-assume natin na a planet's orbit a star or another, another body. Tapos merong small na mga shifts doon. Na kapag lumalapit siya doon sa pag lumalapit siya doon sa object, um, sa paningin mo, nabublue shift naman yung image. Tapos, pag lumalayo siya, sa paningin mo, nare-red shift yung image. So, yun yung pinaplot nila dito. Yan. Okay? So, eto so far, yung pinakamaraming pinakamaraming na-discover na planet using this method. Then, yung third one is yung direct imaging. Siyempre, yun yung gagamit ka na ng telescope, tapos mapipicture mo siya. Which is very impossible kasi kahit nga sa own solar system natin, medyo hindi natin nagawa yung direct imaging. Okay? Next slide, please. So far, dito, as of September 24, itong count na to, meron ng 1,137 planetary system na na-discover, then meron 467 na multi-planetary system. So, yung pinakamalapit sa atin na ka-Earth size natin is yung Alpha Centauri BB. Pero wala siya sa habitable zone. Ano ba yung habit habitable zone? Yun yung may enough space lang siya, katulad ng diameter, ng, ng area or space between us sa sun at saka sa earth para ma-form yung liquid water. So medyo, medyo ano lang, medyo mali, medyo ako lang, medyo feeling ko mali lang kasi yung, parang why do you have to assume na dapat liquid water yung nasa, nandito. Pero hindi ba natin naisip na pwede namang may ibang forms of life na magsusurvive kahit hindi water yung ano. Medyo bias lang tayo, di ba? So, sino ba yung naghahanap ng extrasolar planet? Ito yung si Kepler. Kepler yung observatory at saka yung probe na nagde-discover ng ano, ng mga extrasolar planets. Next slide, please. So, ito yung na-discover nila na currently potential, potentially habitable exoplanets. Among dito sa lahat ng to, si Gliese 667c yung nakikita nilang medyo probable kasi medyo kasayis ng Earth, medyo kasing distance lang siya nung, nung, nung parang sa atin, sa Sun. So, ito yung medyo nakikita nilang potential. Meron na bang lumanding na probe dito? Wala pa. So, ito yung new theor theoretical assumption lang nila yon. So, next slide please. So, eto, meron ako ipapakita sa inyo ng mga very odd na extrasolar planets. Sige po. Yan. Ito yung pinaka-favorite ko, yung HD188753. Kasi nilaka siya ng Jupiter, 1.9 light years away lang from Earth, pero meron siyang tatlong star. Kung nakatira ka doon, tatlong sunset, tatlong sunrise yung makikita mo. <laughs> so, parang, ano yung pipiliin mong gigising ka? Sa, sa, sinong sun yung sasambahin mo para gumising ka matulog? So, syempre, meron siyang tinatawag na main star. Pero, the thing is, hindi naman to habitable eh, kasi sobrang laki ng main star niya. Kaya medyo mainit dito sa planet na to. So, yun lang. Yun lang yung ano doon. So, hindi nakatira dito sila, sila Luke Skywalker. Kasi dalawa lang yung star ng planet nun, di ba? Okay, next slide, please. 
Ito naman yung smallest rocky na exoplanet na na-discover nila, na pinangalanan nila na Kepler 10b. So, it is the first rocky alien planet. Pero, yun lang, hindi siya located sa habitable zone. Ano ba yung ano? Kasi ang trend sa exoplanet hunting, dapat rocky, tsaka dapat small. Kasi yung small, mas, mas, the smaller, mas challenging siya nga natin, di ba? Yun. So, yun yung trend. Palikitan. Parang pagandahan kayo ng cards. Palikitan kayo na nahanap na exo exosolar planets. Next slide, please. Tapos, ito naman yung pinakamalaki. Which is about 1.7 times size ng Jupiter. Kaya lang, sabi nila, ito yung tinatawag nila ng puppy planet. Na kasi sobrang laki niya, tapos sobrang gaang laman niya. Na parang theoretically daw, dapat di nag -e Pero just the same, naanap naman nila dun sa Kepler na yon at pinangalanan pa nga nila na TRES-4. Located ito 1,400 light years away from Earth and zips around its parent star in only three and a half days. Malaki siya, pero magaang. Tapos mabilis siyang mag-rotate dun sa star niya. Three and a half days lang, tapos na yung isang taon niya. Next slide, please. So, yung coldest exoplanet naman na na-discover nila is like negative 220 degrees, tapos 5.5 times size ng Earth, and malungkot to planet na to kasi yung star na inuorbitan niya, red dwarf na. Kung baga, yung dim star na hindi na, hindi na tulad ng star natin na main sequence. So, medyo madilim sa planet niya, kaya malamig rin. Pa, next slide please. Since na itong lecture natin is about appreciation of the universe, I'm showing you nga yung mga strangest thing na meron sa universe natin. So, we go naman dito sa mga strangest things in the universe. Neutron star. So, ano ba yung neutron star? So, yung neutron star is, um, is a remnant ng isang previous na malaking star which is about 8 to 25 times size ng sun. So, bakit siya neutron star? Kasi, yung star na to, after niya mag-explode mag into a type 2 supernova, um, nag-collapse uli pa balik yung sa core, yung gravity. Kung baga may gravity, ah, gravity acted on it, dun sa core, pinresurize niya ulit yung core ng star until such time na nag-fuse na yung proton at electron para makabuo ng neutrons. So, purely, itong star na to is composed of neutron. So, yun yung amazing sa kanya. Okay? So, next slide, please. Ano naman yung magnetar? Yung magnetar naman is a type of neutron star na malaki ang magnetic field. Bakit mayroon siyang magnetic field? Kasi raw, medyo rotating, rotating itong magnetar. Kaya habang nagro-rotate siya, nagkaka-produce siya ng magnetic field. Ano ba yung ano ba yung featuring, ano ba yung pinaka-main feature size ng isang neutron star? Usually, hindi sila lalaki sa 20 kilometers. Pero sobrang dense nila. Mas mabigat pa sila sa sun ng mga 5 times ganun. Pero sobrang liit lang nila. Kasi laki lang ng isang ng isang, parang kasi laki lang ng Pasig o, or ano yun. Basta isang city lang. Isang city kasi 20 kilometers lang ang radius niya eh. Okay? So, next slide, please. Then, we have the pulsars or the pulsating star. Type din ito ng neutron star, pero nag-i-emit siya ng mga pulses. Kaya lang yung emission ng pulses na yun, kaya lang natin siya nakikita kasi nakadirect siya sa atin. Pag nakatalikod siya, paano mo masasabing pulsar siya? Hindi. Pag nakikita mo lang siya na nagpa-pulsate sa'yo kasi nakaharap sa atin yung ito, nakaharap sa atin itong mga itong itong uh, pulse emissions na to. So, yan. Ano ba ang sinasabi niya? This radiation can only be observed when the beam of emission is pointing towards the Earth. Um, these are very dense and have short regular rotational periods. Pero, it produces very precise interval between pulses that range from milliseconds to seconds for an individual pulse hours. So, yan. Sa pang weird thing. Uh, next slide, please. 
quasars. Ano naman yung quasars? So, matatandaan nyo ba yung mga differences na yun? Yung quasars naman, yung quasi-stellar radiosaurs. So, actually, this is just, ano, hindi ito star eh. It's like starlight. Kasi nung may nag-observe sa radio observatory, yung mga radio astronomers natin, meron silang nade-detect na mga radio signals. Pero hindi nila maintindihan kung ano. So, iba pa to dun sa CMB yan. Yung sa cosmic background radiation, iba pa to dun. So, ito, parang nakadirect nila kung saan galing eh. So, pero may mga points daw in, in space na pinanggagalingan ng quasar. So, sinabi nila na this must be um, something na hindi star pero nag -e emit siya ng, ng radio frequency. So, sabi nila, a quasar is usually nasa center ng galaxy tapos powered by black hole. Paano siya na-power ng black hole? Kasi di ba yung black hole kapag meron siyang nasak na material? mag -e eject siya ng ano, yung accretion disk. So, yung ejection ng mga particles na yun yung nakukuha ni, ni quasars. Yun yung nagpa-power sa kanya. Okay, sino gusto like magpunta sa black hole? <laughs> so, may tinitheorize sila kung may black hole, may white hole. Actually, yung white hole, hindi pa nila napapatunayan kung nasaan. So, kung ano yung ginagawa ni black hole, yung ginagawa ni white hole, yung reverse. Totally, walang makakalapit sa white hole. Kasi si black hole, at, at 23,000 kilometers pa lang na nasa kanya ka na, na nandun ka sa range niya, automatic na yun na masasuck in ka niya. At 23,000 kilometers. So, pag sa white hole naman, never ka makakalapit sa kanya kahit anong pilit mo. So, yun yung sinasabi, yun daw yung, yun daw yung sa kabilang dulo nun eh. Sa kabilang dulo ng black hole. Kaya ito yung isa sa mga kinus, kinakonceptualize na na parang wormhole rin ang dating eh. Yung, yung may pasok dito and then yung may klabas doon. Yung parang ganun. <laughs> so anyway, ano ba bang nangyayari pag nagpunta ka sa black hole? Literally, mapa, ano kayo, may spaghetti pipe kayo. Ibig sabihin, pag nag-deep ka, nag-dive ka sa loob ng black hole, inuna mo yung ulo mo. At first, medyo wala kang mararamdaman eh. Pero ma, ano, makikita ng mga tao na parang na-elongate yung ulo mo, tapos na-elongate ka. Nasishred ka na pala, particle per particle. So you appear na para kang nagiging spaghetti, pero particle by particle, nasishred out ka na ng black hole. Naririp ka niya apart. Okay? So saan ba may black hole? Sa so, center ng Sagittarius. Uh, pangalan ni Sydney One. Yun yung name ng black hole na nakita nila. Pero alam niyo ba, merong, merong nagko-contest na scientist na physically impossible daw yung black hole. Kasi ano ba yung, ano ba yung theoretical assumptions kung bakit tayo nakakreate ng concept ng black hole? Siyempre yung sa relativity pa rin ni Einstein na pagka sobrang heavy ng object, mawa-warp niya talaga yung space, di ba? Yung warping na yun that creates the, the whole effect. Tapos, meron naman daw kasi hindi ma-reconcile doon. Sa quantum theory daw, sinasabi na no information can be hidden. Parang yung sinasabi kasi sa black hole, di ba? Pag may pumasok na light, walang, hindi na siya makaka-escape. Yung sa quantum theory naman na yun, quantum mechanics, quantum theory na postulate na yun. Mali, yung assumption, mali daw yung assumption na no, no information can be lost sa universe. So, yun yung argument na scientist na yun. Yung part na yun. Although sinasabi niya, probably Hawking radiation yung sinasabing black hole. Pero not to the point na makakakreate ng black hole. You can check it, check it out. Kasi kailan lang yun pinost eh. So, hindi pa peer-reviewed yung, yung tao kasi kumbaga pinag-aaralan pa ng mga scientists. Next slide, please. So, yan. Si black hole natin is just 6,000 light years away from us. Isang light year is 3 million or 9.3 million kilometers, di ba? So, ganun siya kalayo. Okay, next slide. So, na isa sa mga strange things sa universe yung water at saka Earth's atmosphere because it is very unique talaga sa dito sa 
ina-observe natin na universe right now. Okay, next slide please. Magbibigay ako ng prize kung sino makakapagsabi sa akin kung saan galing yung water sa earth. Meron ba kayong guest? Hindi pwedeng ano ah, H at saka dalawang H at saka isang O ah. Kasi yun yung sagot sa akin ng, ng 8 year old ko na anak eh. Sabi niya, dalawang H at saka isang O. Yeah, tama yun, H2O, ba? Diba? Pero pa paano, nag paano nagkaroon ng H2O sa Earth? Yan, inom kayo ng inom ng tubig, hindi niya naman alam kung saan galing. Painumin ko kaya kayo ng liquid nitrogen. O, sirit na. Sige, go. Where did water from the whole of this earth came from? Uh, kung di nyo may tatanong, kasi what I do for a living is I manage a company na nagsisell ng mga ultra-pure na water. Ultra-pure means H2O na lang yung nasa water. Walang mga contamination. That's why I give, I give lectures then about water, paano nagagawa, paano pinaprocess. So, yun. So, go tayo kung bakit. Kung saan galing. Tatlo yung best na theories, ha? So, try na lang try na nalang isipin kung ano yung kung ano sa tatlo yung the best. Next. So, it, it came from down, the cooling down of the primordial world to the point where the outcast volatile components were held in an atmosphere of sufficient pressure for the stabilization and retention of liquid water. So, during daw ng formation ng, ng bagong earth. Umabot daw tayo sa point na yung atmospheric pressure is suit, uh, suited enough para ma-stabilize daw yung liquid water. Ang pinaka-strange thing sa water actually is it is the only compound in our world that exists in three natural states. Solid, liquid, gas. Nakikita natin lahat. Kasi meron tayong mga compounds na nag exist lang in one or two states. Pero sa water, in three, nat nag exist siya sa tatlong natural states. So, yun yung pinaka-amazing thing. Kasi hindi nyo makikita yun talaga sa ibang planeta eh. Okay? So, sabi nila, yung, yung condensation ng mga, like yun yan, yung volcanic eruption, yung condensation ng sa atmosphere na merong part na carbon dioxide at saka um, water vapor, Medyo nag-cool down siya at, at enough yun para ma-precipitate ma yung H2O into a liquid water. Okay, next slide please. Yung second theory is... Next slide po. Ayun nga, resort, resulted from volcanic eruption. So, dalawa lang pala, sorry. Then, the second one is from the comets. Pero kung imagine mo, kahit na isang libong comets yung, yung nag-landing sa Earth, Tapos, iniisip nila na yung, yung ice, ice core nun, yun yung natunaw para mabuo yung ocean. Kulang pa rin, di ba? So, the best theory talaga is yung nasa una. Yung nag-condensate siya na nag-precipitate from the primordial world natin na nag-stabilize yung mga temperature and then atmospheric pressure for it to form in three states. Okay, next slide please. So, aside from that, yung sa mga planets na binisit natin, um, actually, binisit yun ng mga probe ni Kepler, um, tayo lang yung atmos may, may healthy na atmosphere na merong oxygen. So, yung oxygen kasi is a good driver sa mga processes, mga natural processes ng life, eh, like oxidation, reduction, wala yung oxygen hindi rin hindi rin hindi tayo magkakaroon ng combustion de ba so yon isa sa mga strange things sa universe next slide please then life so 
ito yung timeline timeline ng life natin. Yan. So, from the formation pa lang ng universe, na nag-assemble yung mga proton, neutron, tapos yung nag-react siya sa, tapos siya nagkaroon ng mga activity sa star para makapag-produce ng heavier elements, tapos yung nakapag-produce ng heavier elements, nagkaroon tayo ng chance na makaform ng mga simple na nucle nucle nucleotides, tapos na naging protein and all. So, yung area na yun falls under the prebiotic chemistry. So, th this is what, what is amazing dito sa universe, is yung formation ng life. Kasi it's not, it's very rare naman kung saan, wala nga tayong mahanap ng mga ano eh, ng mga other life forms eh, no matter what we do. So, meron na po ha, pa ilan-ilan sa meteors, dun sa meteorite na naglanding sa Australia, pero sabi nila, possible daw na earth contamination na rin yun from the earth. Kaya medyo inaano pa nila yung Merchkin, Merchkin Stone meteorite na yun. Pinoprow pa rin nila. But it's most, li um, most likely na merong mga, meron daw mga ano, um, simple amino acid na nakuha dun sa meteorite na yun. Next slide please. So sino ba yung nagsabi na um, life evolved in the oceans during the period when atmosphere was reducing, containing H2, H2O, Ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, but walang free oxygen. So, ito si Oparin and Haldane. Actually, um, sila yung nag-assert na, na yung mga organic compounds na yun were synthesized from non-biological non origin through the help of UV light. So, ano yung UV light? Yun yung galing sa sun. So, maybe kung wala talagang sun, wala rin mapoform na, na light dito sa atin eh. So, next slide please. Gumawa, ay, hindi nakita yung experiment eh. Alam niyo yung uh, Mueller-Urey um, experiment, wherein gumawa siya ng class, gumawa siya ng, gumawa siya ng setup, tapos nilagay niya yung mga compounds na sinasabi na yung mga first um, elements ng formation ng universe, yung may carbon, may konting phosphorus, may nitrogen, tapos... Um, tinry nilang nagyan ng mga signals or electric electric signals like parang sinasimulate nila yung lightning. Nakaform yun ng simple amino acid. Yun yung ano, Mule-Ure experiment. So, hindi lang nasama din sa slide niya. So, it means na like given the favorable condition na ganun, makakaform nga ng amino acid. Basta tama yung combination. Tapos, Tama yung conditions. Like, merong triggering factors like nga yung UV, UV light. So, ano pa yung isang amazing na or strange thing dito sa universe? So, next slide please. Siyempre, tayo yun. yun. So, kasi tayo pa lang so far yung nakikita natin na intelligent being dito sa universe. Pero for all we know, Baka naman, ayaw lang nila magpakita sa atin, di ba? So, isipin mo yun. Lalo, minsan, lumating na pala sila dito, tapos nakakausap pa ng Jejemon. Parang, <laughs> sabi ng alien, ano ba yan? Is this earth? Parang gano'n. Pero, kidding aside, um, naniniwala ba kayo na hindi lang tayo alone? Siyempre, di ba? Kasi napaka-arrogant naman kung isipin natin na tayo lang talaga yun nandito. Just so happen na, Baka lang hindi tayo at the same frequency sa kanila. So, I hope you enjoyed yung space appreciation natin. And, meron ba kayong question? Uh, in fact, the uh, PAS, Philippine Astronomical Society, is planning, is actually going to hold an observation session sa pag-aas observatory sa loob ng UP Diliman. So, doon sa mga interesadong mag-observe mag ng lunar eclipse, this coming Wednesday, siya lang yung lunar eclipse natin this year sa, sa Philippines na makikita natin. So, October 8 yon. So, this coming October 8, uh, ipapakita ko sa inyo yung isasimulate natin yung eclipse. Huwag kayong maniwala na doon sa mga mga news na o oh, may lumalabas na kasi magiging may inire-relate nila yung eclipse, uh, blood moon, so, magtaka tayo pagka hindi naging red yung moon pag may eclipse. So, normal yung eclipse na nagiging red kasi yung earth may atmosphere. 
Nakita niyo na ba yung Earth from outer space pag may eclipse? Siyempre, hindi pa. Pero ipapakita ko sa inyo. Isa simulate natin. Kung nasa moon tayo, ano ang itsura ng Earth? Pag nakatingin tayo sa Earth, pag natakpan ng Earth yung sun, yung makikita natin yung reason kung bakit nagiging red ang color ng the moon during a lunar eclipse. So normally, sinasabi natin pag may eclipse, sinasabi natin, may, may pagpula ang buwan, ano? Bakit ba nangyayaring eclipse? ng moon, yung inner circle, kung nasaan yung moon, yun ang tinatawag natin umbra. Umbra, that's the inner shadow na, na pag sinabi natin umbra, dalawang klase kasi ang shadow natin. There are two parts of a shadow. Umbra and penumbra. So, siguro napansin nyo kanina do sa presentation ni Jenny kanina, andun din yung umbra at penumbra. Saan yung ginamit? Sa sunspots. Sa sunspots kasi yung inner part ng sunspot Uh, which is the darkest portion ng sunspot, umbra tao doon din, the outer part ng uh, sunspot, yung tinatawag natin yung penumbra. So, bakit ganun? Dahil nga sa shadow. So, kung simulate ko to, balik ko lang, ha? So, natin sa so Wednesday, okay, mag-ulat, na pag-akit ng normal na nakakita tayo ng, ng moonrise mapula o orange, di ba? Magulat tayo pag nakita nyo ang moonrise, lag na full moon, puti. Bakit? Once lang natin makikita yon. Pwede mangyari yun, yes. Pero once lang, pagkatapos ng patay na tayo. Bakit? Tinanggal natin yung atmosphere ng Earth. Kaya natin nakikita yung mapula yung moon kasi may atmosphere. Ganun din yung sun. Nakikita natin bright yung sun sa taas. Okay? Bright siya sa taas. Pagkatapos, pagka Sunset na, nakita natin, orange ang color ng sun. Mas, mas mapula yung sun, mas polluted ang atmosphere natin. Yun ang indicator. Kailan natin pwede makita mas mapula yung sun? Pag umulan sa hapon. Kahalabaw, nagkaroon ng pagulan sa hapon, thunderstorm. Lahat ng mga pollutants na iniimit during the day, binababa na kagad. So pagdating ng sunset, mapula yung sun. So... Maganda ba yun? Hindi rin. Bakit? Ibig sabihin, mas maaga tayong mag inhale ng maduming hangin. Normally kasi, ang ini-inhale nating hangin, nag nagiging mas madumi siya after mga midnight. During the day, mainit na mainit, lahat ng pollutants nasa taas. Kaya nga pag dumaan tayo sa EDSA ng tanghaling tapat, napakalinis. Kaya pag dumaan tayo ng madaling araw sa EDSA, parang may smog. No? Kinakaingitan nyo sa province, buti pa ang EDSA may smog. <laughs> Naka, naka, naka kaingit, ano? Gusto nilang makakita raw. Sabi ko, maganda na sa probinsya, sa province walang smog. Ibig sabihin, indicator, malinis ang hangin. Fog, pwede pa. Pero sa, dito sa Metro Manila, smog yung sa atin. Special yun. So, makikita nyo dito. So, eto. Makikita nyo sa simulate lang natin. Yung moon natin, dada, pagagalawin na natin siya. Forward pin time. Gumagalaw siya ngayon, mapapansin nyo, yung inner, yung outer shadow, papasok na yun ng moon natin sa outer shadow ng Earth, yung penumbra. So, pag dumaan dyan ng moon natin, eto yung penumbra part. Eto yung P1 niya. So, mapapansin nyo, may konting darkening na doon sa moon, pero once na pumasok na siya, minsan hindi nyo mapag gano'ng mapapansin, pero once na pumasok na siya doon sa umbra, which is the inner shadow, magiging red na yung part na yun. So, nakita nyo? So, ganito rin yung mangyayari sa atin. Ang ideal kasi, kung dadaan sa gitna mismo, mas matagal yung lunar, lunar eclipse, yung totality. So, ito yung tinatawag natin totality. Pag sinabi natin totality, nasa loob na siya ng inner shadow, yung umbra, yung color red, yung moon. Then, after nun, after an hour or two, depending kasi sa kung saan siya tumaan, mag, lalabas na siya sa penumbral part na naman, doon magsisimula na uli lumiwanan. So, yan yung makikita natin. Laging ganyan na nakita natin sa eclipse. Na hindi automatic red cabbage. Siya. Gradual yun. Mas mapuli yung moon, mas polluted. Buti hindi pa sumasabog yung mayong volcano. Kasi kung halimbawa sumabog ang mayong volcano bago mag-lunar eclipse, 
Siguro yung mga tao sa Bicol, mas mapula ang lunar eclipse sa makikita nila. So, yan yung tinatawag natin part na yung mechanics kung bakit meron tayong lunar eclipse. Okay? So, yung nakita natin from, from Earth yan. So, I think this, sinasabi natin, ito yung diet na. Okay, I think cross-section. So, sun, earth, moon. So, diretso yan. Anong face ng moon? Full moon. So, during full moon, nagkakaroon ng lunar eclipse. Pag ang moon naman, nasa gitna between earth and sun, yung moon ang face nun, doon naman nagkakaroon ng solar eclipse. So, kung makikita natin, yung umbra, yun yung inner shadow, yung penumbra yung outer shadow. Okay? Mas, mas malayo ang moon sa earth, mas matagal ang eclipse kasi mas maliit siya. Mas malapit ang moon sa earth, mas malaki siya, mas short yung totality ng eclipse. So, yung makikita natin, medyo swerte tayo kasi after sunset, pag set ng sun, by the time na mag moonrise, mapula na kagad siya. Tapos na kasi yung penumbra, yung P1 natin, yung pagpasok na sa penumbra. Sa ibang countries, makikita nila yon Sa atin, hindi natin makikita ang kompleto, pero makikita natin, uh, kompleto yung totality niya. So, makikita natin, pag akit ng moon, mapula na kagad siya, then after almost an hour, matatapos yung, yung lalabas na siya sa penumbra, uh, umbral part niya. So, ito yung diagram ng, ng uh, shadow ng Earth. Okay. Ito yung sinasabi ko, isa-simulate natin. Kung nasa moon tayo, yan ang makikita natin. Tinagpa ng Earth, yung Sun. Okay? Unfortunately, medyo malayo yung tagla. Kasi ito sa screen, yung projector natin. Uh, ewan ko kung napapansin nyo pa, pwede pa pa natin i-off yung light para talagang total eclipse tayo dito. <laughs> Kasi makikita nyo, may color orange sa paligid ng Earth. Napapansin nyo ba? Konti lang. Oo, pasensya na. Kasi konti lang talaga yon. Ganun kasi kakapal yung atmosphere ng Earth. Hindi ito nakikita sa ibang planet. Kung ba may eclipse, kung ba mag-observe ka sa Mercury. No? Nasa, nasa, nasa gitna natin ang Mercury between Sun, Mercury, tapos ikaw nag-observe. All black lang yan. Kasi walang atmosphere ng Mercury. Ang Venus may atmosphere din. Ang Earth meron din. So, yung nakikita nyo ngayon, totally kinover ng Earth. Kaya makikita nyo, Sige, play ko na lang ulit. Pinyo natin. So, lalabas ngayon siya, tapos na yung eclipse. Ganon. Okay? So, yun yung mechanics sa magiging eclipse natin. Uh, actually, nung tinitignan ko kasi ito, naisip ko nga pala, may meeting ngayon. Ngayon nga, meron tayo. Tapos, sabi ko, share ko. Gusto ko i-share sa inyo ito. At least, maintindihan natin yung mangyayari eclipse at paki- share din sa ibang tao kung bakit nagkakaroon ng lunar eclipse. Normal lang na nagkakaroon ng lunar eclipse, walang masama dyan. Normal na nagiging color red ng eclipse dahil nga sa atmosphere ng Earth. Ngayon, kung itatanong natin gano'n ba kadalas ang, ang eclipse, um, seven eclipses possible sa isang taon. Yun ang maximum niya, seven eclipses. Tatlong solar, apat na lunar, o apat na solar, tatlong lunar. So, sa ngayon, Kung mapapansin nyo, itong eclipse na to, two weeks after, sa so October 23, mayroong solar eclipse. Excited na ba kayo? <laughs> Oo, kasi hindi natin makikita yon dito. <laughs> hindi visible sa Philippines. Unfortunately, hindi visible sa Philippines yung eclipse dito sa atin. So, ang susunod na eclipse na makikita sa atin, ano pa? April 9, 2000. April 4, April 4, 2016 pa. 15, next year, next year. Meron tayo. Pero partial lang ngayon. 
So, panig partial, no? Panig partial yung eclipse na makikita natin. Kung gusto nyo makikita ng total solar eclipse sa Pilipinas, meron din. Sa April din yun. Sa April 2042. Pero napakaganda, no? Kasi dadaan siya sa Visayas, dadaan siya sa Boracay, dadaan din yung eclipse mismo sa Mayon Volcano. So, yung mga tao, yung area na yun, sa Metro Manila, partial lang. So, yun ang maganda. I, I've seen solar eclipses. Nakailang solar eclipses na ako. Nakakita na ako ng solar eclipse. Ilang beses na. Ang pinakaunang solar eclipse ko nakita yung sa Mindanao noong 1988. Talagang na uh, yung daytime, naging gabi. Lumabas yung mga stars, lumabas yung mga planets. Naging malamig yung buong paligid. So, ganun ang nangyari pagka solar eclipse. Pag lunar eclipse, nothing special except magiging red yung moon. Pagkatapos nun, Wala, walang walang effect naman yun sa sa atmosphere natin. So ito yung ito naman, ito naman partial eclipse lang ang tawag dito. Pag dumaan yung moon sa penumbra, sa umbra, panay partial eclipse lang yan. Halos hindi natin napapansin. This one we call a partial solar eclipse. Okay? So napansin yun hindi siya nag-red. Pero pag sinabi naman natin, oops, sorry. Pagka naman, ito naman, partial, okay, partial total eclipse, uh, pa partial umbral eclipse lang siya. Pumasok lang sa umbra, pero hindi naman totally na na naging red. Okay. Pagka total talaga, ito yung sinasabi natin, total Lunar eclipse. So, may tatong klase, partial penumbral, partial umbral, at saka ito, total lunar eclipse. So, yung makikita natin sa Wednesday, it's a total lunar eclipse. Yung sinasabi kong, ang solar eclipse kasi, pwede magkaroon ng kapartner lagi yan eh. Pagka may lunar eclipse, two weeks before or two weeks after may solar eclipse din. Laging ganun. Yun nga lang, hindi natin makikita pareho yun. Kung nakita natin yung lunar eclipse, in other parts naman, sa ibang country naman o ibang side ng Earth naman yung makakita ng solar eclipse. Kung nakita naman natin yung solar eclipse, yung kabilang side naman na makakita ng lunar eclipse. So, hindi lahat na sa atin. So, ano lang, uh, kung gusto nyo makita pareho, magta-travel ka. Pupunta tayo sa ibang bansa. Okay? Okay, ito yung sky natin ngayon mismo. Forward natin. Okay, pag sunset. Napapansin nyo na yung sun. Sunset. Ah, pansin nyo mabuti yung position ng west. Nakita nyo ba yung, yung position ng sunset? Actually, yung sunset natin, ito, ito yung sun. Sinya? Medyo paid na kasi pagdating doon, eh, no? Okay. Forward ko lang. Kapansin nyo? Starting today, October 4, officially, mas mahaba na ang gabi sa daytime. So, hindi... Gusto ko lang i-correct, ha? I, I remember six months ago, nandito din kami, yung PAS, nandito rin, dito rin nagkaroon ng monthly meeting. Na-explain ko doon, that was March, March 22 ata yun. Huwag di ako nagkakamali. March 22, Saturday, Saturday yun, ano? nandito kami. That was a day after ng March 21. Yung March 21 kasi yung tinatawag nating summer solstice. That's the longest, longest day of the year. Ano? <coughs> eh, sorry, equinox pala yung March 21 then six months ago. So, Equal day and night. Yung exactong sunset natin sa west, yung exactong sunrise sa east. Pero, uh, a week ago, almost two weeks na, September 23, yun yung tinatawag naman natin autumnal equinox. Equinox, yung sunrise natin exactong east ulit, tapos ang sunset exactong west. So, ang mali kasi doon sa sinasabi sa media, kahit sa pag-asap, sinasabi nila, 
Yung September 23 daw, start na ng paghaba ng gabi. Kasi bare months na nga. Oo, bare months na, pero sa totoo lang, pag sinabi natin equinox, ang haba ng suns, sunrise, ano, sunrise dapat at sunset, parehong oras. So 12 hours daytime, 12 hours nighttime. Kaso, problema, wala tayo sa equator. Kung nasa equator tayo, yung oras ng sunrise sa equator, 6 o'clock, ang sunset, 6 o'clock. Pero dito sa atin sa Philippines, hindi. Bakit? Kasi nasa taas tayo ng equator. 15 point, uh, 14 point 5 degrees tayo, Metro Manila. So, i-round off na lang natin, 15 degrees. So, angat tayo. So, late tayo. Ang equinox natin, yung local equinox natin, actually, kahapon, yung sunrise, eksaktong uh, 5.48, ang sunset, 5.48 din. So, nag-adjust tayo. So, starting today, mas mahaba na ng isang minuto ang suns, ang, ang night time, mas maiksi na ang day time. <laughs> Tapos, habang tumatagal, kaya kung napapansin nyo, mas maaga ng dumidilim. Tapos, late, na, ang hari naman ang sunrise natin. Di ba, mga 6.30 na bago pa mag sunrise. So, nagsisimula na, starting today. Every, every day yan, pahaba na ng pahaba ang so, expect na natin na mas lalangin na yung panahon natin. Technically, yun ang dapat. Hindi nung equinox. Pero nung equinox, nung September 23, kahit saan sa mundo, eksaktong east, eksaktong west, ang position ng sun. Pero ngayon, kung mapapansin nyo, iba na ang position niya. Okay? Ito yung star na speak and yet, and yet yung mercury. Nabanggit kanya ng Jenny, no? Uh, Mercury, nakikita natin yan, pero mababa ang Mercury. Unfortunately, cloudy ngayon. Ang Mercury hindi yan tumatagal, eh. Lagi nasa west lang siya o nasa east. Tapos, etong Saturn. Ito naman ang Mars. So, etong Saturn, kung titignan natin, gusto nyo bang makita ng Kung talagang Saturn yan, okay, center natin siya. So, mamagnify ko lang. Ewan ko bakit may guhit dyan sa... <laughs> so, ito yung Saturn. Ewan ko ba? Sorry, ha? Lagi na lang. <laughs> ang pangalan niyan ay Saturn. Pero pag pinapakita mo ang tawag sa kanya ay wow. <laughs> Tawag ko. Bakit? Pumayin niya. Lahat kayo, sabay-sabay. Ano ang sinabi niyo? Nakita niya. Wow. wow. Sige, palitan. Yan ang planet wow. <laughs> so kung gagamit tayo ng telescope, yung makikita niyo yung star na hindi natutuwing ko, yun yung planet wow. <laughs> Tapos, may isa pang planet. Ang pangalan niya ay Mars, pero hindi ko alam po anong tawag niyo sa kanya. Oh! <laughs> Ayan ang planet Mars. <laughs> Dahil nilagay ko na yung pangalan para may guide kayo. Pagka tinignan natin sa telescope yan, oh! Mars talaga yan. Okay? So, visible ang, uh, ang Mars, visible ang Saturn after sunset, pero ang Mercury ay daw kasi medyo mahirap makita, mababa siya. Ngayon, forward ko lang yung time, punta tayo sa east. Ngayong gabi ito ah, ngayong gabi, yung date natin. Forward ko siya. So, yun yung muna natin, kahapon ka sa first, the other day, first quarter. So, forward ko lang siya. So, nakita niya na yung Pleiades, yung Rosary tinatawag. Ayan na si Orion, market na. Okay, ayan na yung Winter Triangle. Then, stop ako sandali. Ito na yung Jupiter. Jupiter, ang pangalan niyan. Yan ang pinakamalaking planet sa solar system. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, yun yung Galilean satellites. May eclipse pa siya. Okay? So, merong eclipse dito. Kikita nyo? Shadow yun ng eclipse ng moon niya. Ayaw. Iksa sa mga okay. Forward natin para makita nyo yung paggalaw niya. Okay? So, nakita nyo? Now, Papaguhin ko lang yung date. Papakita ko na sa inyo yung actual. Paguhin uh, natin yung date. October 8 natin, October 8, sunset. Uh, tingnan niyo yung oras, ha? sunrise, October 8, 5.46, sunset, 5.40. So, mas mahaba na ng 6 minutes ang night time natin. So, ito yung mangyayari, ito yung lunar eclipse. Kita niyo? Ayun yung moon natin. Red, tapos, tapos na yung eclipse. Okay? Pero hindi pa yung totally tapos. Natapos lang yung totality. Balik natin. Reverse ko lang ulit, ah. So, around 7.30, mga 7.20 yung kalagitnaan ng eclipse natin. Kaya yung nakita yung 7.20 yung oras. So, balik ko lang sa moonrise. Okay? pag ng moon, total eclipse na siya. Tapos, by 8 o'clock, mga 8.30, mag bago mag 9 o'clock, tapos na yung eclipse. Pakita ko lang sa inyo ngayon, center natin ng food. Okay, ito. Pinalaki ko na ito. Ito yung makikita natin at sunset. Pag sunset. Okay, bakit siya? Forward natin yung time. Okay, nakikita nyo na may part na yung penumbral. Pumasok na siya. Tapos nasa umbral na siya ngayon. Pagiging red na siya. Then, lalabas na uli siya. Nakikita nyo? So, bakit yung observe yung eclipse? Isang magandang, dahil, isang magandang sagot yan para mapatunayan natin na bilog ang mundo. Kasi alam natin, ang shadow natin, depende kung anong shape mo. So yung mga tao nag-iisip nun, nagsasabi nun ng mga tao na ang earth daw ay flat, pagdating doon sa dulo ng dagat, eh, malalag, malalaglag ka. During the time of Magellan, ganun pa rin ang idea nila. Pero yung mga Greeks, alam nila na bilog. Bakit? Sabi nila, tignan mo ang moon pag may eclipse. Bakit may curve na shadow? Kanino yon shadow ng earth. So, doon pa lang alam na nila na bilog talaga ang earth. So, may tanong pa kayo? Oh, wala nang tanong? Okay, uh, again, in-invite namin kayo. If you want to join us, pwede kayo mag... mag uh, pumunta na lang kayo sa sa Pag-asa Observatory, nasa lobby ng UP Diliman. Nasa likod siya ng College of Education. Kung magko-commute kayo, bababa kayo sa, sa may sa may ang, ang jeepney stop doon, meron jeepney stop na uh, sa College of Education tapos lalakarin yung sa likod doon andoon yung papunta sa UP ano, Pag-asa Observatory within the campus yun ng UP Diliman So, ang maganda noon may bonus pa, aside from the lunar eclipse merong meteor shower Draconids, Draconids that same night then, pick din siya, kaso Hindi, sinasabi ko na, ang Draconids kasi, hindi siya kasing ganda ng, ng Orionids sa October 18. Okay, maganda yon Tapos, um, yung Geminids, 
Maganda rin yun. Yung Gemini sa pinakamaganda. Pero yung Draconids, siguro mga... Pwede tayo makakita ng mga 20 to 30 shooting stars kung magandang sky sa loob ng isang oras. Pero I doubt, kasi full moon nung gabi na yun, mababawasan yun, so mga 20, 15 to 20 meteors siguro per, per, per hour. Draconids yun, ang tawag doon. Kasi manggagaling sa constellation ng Draco, nasa north yun, nasa north direction natin. Okay? So, meron, kayo, meron ka bang question tungkol sa lunar eclipse? So, uh, nandun kami, members of the Philippine Astronomical Society will be at Pagasa Observatory City. Normally, ginagawa yun sa Manila Observatory, pero this time, kasi nga maaga yung eclipse, so, ina-expect namin na baka umuwi rin yung mga tao. So, pwede pa umuwi kasi weekday eh, Wednesday ang mangyayari yung eclipse natin. So, sana may time kayo. Pwede kayo mag-observe ng eclipse. Okay? Maraming sa uh, I started the slide out with this. Uh, I think all of you are very familiar what that is, what ship that is, right? This is uh, Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, when we were growing up in the 1970s, uh, 80s, this, were prob this was probably the most shown TV. This was the show. Uh, this was the TV show that uh, made several generation, several generations in this world dream of going to the stars. Okay. Uh, and its final, its statement, as they always start, space, the final frontier. They always say to boldly go to where no man has gone before. Okay? So by, basically, this is what uh, is happening now in our space age astronomy. Okay? So the creator of this is Gene Roddenberry. Uh, I think you're, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this uh, creator, this, uh, this writer. Other than this show, he created a lot of science fiction stories also. I'll leave it up to you to find out, but Gene Roddenberry was one of the most proliferate, uh, uh, proficient writers in uh, science fiction. Okay? Now, uh, next slide please. But before Gene Roddenberry came up with the TV shows, the first science fiction book that was ever written was basically by Jules Burns. The book was entitled From Earth to the Moon and Round the Moon. Okay? And it was in the 1870s that this person uh, wrote about being a man being able to go around the moon. If you're not familiar with Jules Burns, perhaps you heard of the other books such as 20,000 League Under the Sea. Journey to the Center of the Universe, uh, Center of the Earth, Senrik Sulat. No? There are a lot of books that he has written. Okay? So, in this concept, if you can look at it, you can see the cap, if you can see the, okay, it's not very clear on the, on the screen, but basically on the lower right hand is basically a, a, how do you call it, a rocket train. So it's basically four, five compartments of a train shooting up into the sky, Towards the upper left corner, supposed to be you should be seeing a moon on the upper left hand corner. It's a basically that was its concept that somebody that this thing will be launched from a rock from a from a cannon and it will be strong enough and you would pull in with coal and as you fill it with coal, it will propel itself going up to outer space. Okay. If you wonder how you're going to live out there, on the next slide. No? On the next slide, you will see that how he would have thought you would live inside the spaceship. You would have a small window on the upper left-hand corner where you have a stairway going up. And then he would carry his dog beside him and he would have cameras also on the side on his lower left hand. This is an old design. No? Okay? You, you can get the book or copy of the book, you will see this illustration there on this book already there. No? And then of course, he put there on his library there, his study there, he will take notes from there. The idea there is that he will look into the window, peer in there, and he will take notes as he sees it. No? So, next slide please. No? So with that, the biggest question is that, how does one get up there? No? And here I have a series of slide pictures. No? Uh, I have a series of, slide, uh, a series of movie pictures. 
about how about uh, the attempts of sending rockets into the sky. As you can see, they all were kind of failing. This was since 1940. So imagine that, 1870s, there was no concept of about shooting and uh, about going to outer space, being able to shoot into the, uh, going uh, above, above the skies. And here, there was, they were attempting, in 1940s, attempting to launch rockets. If you lived in those times of the year, you'd probably say, that's impossible. No? So, you can see this is during the German war also. No? So, it was the Germans who kind of developed the rockets, uh, but the Germans lost, which was also a good thing. Uh, but the, later on, the next step was that the US, the Russians were the ones who started developing this technology to take it further off. Uh, let's take a look at this. No? Yeah. You know, I can let this play forever. This will take about 30 minutes, but I don't have 30 minutes of uh, no, slideshow time. No? So, but it's good to let you know that it's an entertainment piece seeing how these rockets tried to fly off during those times. Okay? <laughs> Everything going in flames into the sky. Okay? And then, okay. So eventually, with all these attempts, all these experiments that they were doing, somehow, one way, okay, this is USA failures, let's just see this one here. This is how US did their test rocket. It's a slow approach. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah. are the Russians, okay? And it's just, uh, they were able to send the first satellite into orbit, named the Sputnik, okay? Sputnik 1. Uh, Sputnik is basically a 23-inch or 20, almost 2 feet in diameter uh, satellite, no? Uh, it was launched on October 4, 1957. It had its last transmission 22 days later. Up to 20, and it lasted for 22 days. Its last transmission was on October 26, 1957, and in less than a year, or in about six and then four months' time, it re-entered Earth. No? All it did was, as, as it went out to the into space, all it did was to send out signals, communication signals, and from that, the Russians were able to gather data on what, how fast it was going, what was the, what was the uh, conditions of the air there, the the the, the ionosphere in that area. Huh? Okay, so with that, this was one big step going to outer space. It took them only in 1957, huh? from 1870 1957. It's almost like 80 years, more than 80 years or 87 years actually, before we were able to reach to the skies, uh, reach, uh, reach outer space, okay? So on the next slide, no? there was now, this one created some sort of war, which is called the space wars already, no? or even what we call the Cold War. The US and the USSR now, both of them, were now trying to prove to each other who could be, who would have uh, the better technology and who was better, okay? So we have U.S. trying to say that we will send the first man in the moon. 
uh, and, and Russia beat them by about three or four days only. Uh, Russia was able to send their first man to the moon, uh, not to the moon rather, to space rather, in 1961, April 12. And his name was Yuri Gargarin, and he rode on the Vostok 1. He stayed there in space for only about 90 minutes, and he was the first one, first person ever, to see what space, what the Earth looked like from outer space. And he would say that he would be able to see all sea, land, rivers, and sky, all in one view. It would have been interesting, no? So the Russians were the first ones to, land, you know, to, to reach there. Uh, and because of that, because that he was the first man ever to reach outer space, there, would have, there was a big celebration. Of course, the Russians are proud that they were the first person they were the first country to ever launch a man into space. Uh, but overall, the whole world also understood that it was the first human being that was able to launch into space. So here you have it, no? uh, being congratulated, being the first man to ever to go into outer space. No? Okay? So US lost this race. Uh, they were not the first man to go to, the, to, to space. So they said, if we can't get the man to space, we will get the man to the moon. So nonetheless, it took them almost six years. Next slide. It took them almost six years no? for them to get to land on the moon. No? Okay. Uh, here what we have is a slide of uh, what they call this, the eagle, the Apollo, no? Apollo lander, Apollo time lander trying to land, Apollo 11 lander, trying to land on the moon. No? Uh, this is actually a short video clip of how, how it landed. Okay? And this one sent a really, really big message to the world no? that we can actually reach the moon. I know that some of you may have heard 20 years down the road, as early as 5 years, 10 years ago, we've been hearing stories of hoaxes that man never made, made it to the moon. Don't believe that. I wouldn't say that they really made it to the moon. Okay? There is no way they would spend billions and billions of dollars just to tell that they never made it to the moon. These people actually made it to the moon. So what you have here is just a short, uh, what you see is the clip. Uh, as you can see, they, you can see details of the craters as they were landing. Okay? So, the two people in that craft, Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, up to this day, for, uh, no, is uh, telling everybody, we should go now to, to do more, uh, to do space travel. No? Okay? He wants to say, he was trying to say to the world that what he saw should not be limited to only him, but he wants the world to have the opportunity to see what he saw out there in outer space, right? No? So one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 1967, this was 1967, see? I will not finish the slide, let's go on, next. Now ever since 1967, ever since we learned how to launch, a, launch rockets into outer space, we have now <coughs> been able, they have now been able to send out a lot of satellites. As you can see, these are just some satellites there. On the left hand side, left hand uppermost, it's the most famous Hubble telescope. 2007, 2008, I think, Kepler telescope on the lower left. You have an Iridium satellite in the middle, which is a communication telescope. You have Voyager, which is on the upper right hand corner, which continues on and on into outer space, uh, which is the furthest man-made object from Earth right now. We have a couple of weather satellites down there. So we have put up a lot of satellites in terms of weather, communications, GPS, uh, what else can we think of? No? Uh, infrared, science, research, Earth uh, and Earth sensors, so on and so forth. No? And also, of course, military. No? Okay. Next slide. If we put them all together, you will probably see them going around the Earth like that. No? There is a lot of uh, satellites right now that orbits Earth, and that's how they orbit around Earth. Okay? That doesn't look much to you, but if I put it on the next slide, no? on the next slide, 
that's how much satellites are out there. They're about or objects in space. Right now, there's as of 2013, there is about 17,000 objects in outer space. 17,000. Not necessarily satellites. Only less than 5% or about 5% are usable. The rest are just objects in outer space right now. Huh? Okay? Uh, it's kind of filled up already in that, of that screen already. No? Okay? So what I'm leading here is that ever since we learned about the technology of space flight already, it, from a government position, from something that was uh, limited to a government, eventually it became, uh, how do you call this, commercialized. And this is what commercialization does. No? It booms up, creates a large uh, industry where people take advantage of this. Okay, so next slide. The Russians again took the lead in in, uh, in space. No? They were the first one ever. Uh, they built up Mir, the first another uh, uh, a a what they the equivalent to a Skylab or the old the first generation ISS, a space station actually, wherein they could put about three people, only about three people could live in there. They would want to study how will humans survive in space. They are very much way, way advanced. They started in 1986. Maximum capacity of three. It was during that time, from 1986 to 2001, it was one of the longest, uh, how do you call that? One of the longest single flight, space flight ever done. No? Okay. So it stayed in space for that long, 1986 to 2011, that was 15 years, 15 years in space. And the longest person that ever stayed in outer space up to this day, nobody has broken that record, is a total of 437 days and 18 hours. 437 days and 18 hours in 1994 to 1995. His name was Valery uh, Polyakov, another uh, Russian. So in this one proves that humans can live in outer space, although when they come back to Earth, it's a completely different story. Okay. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, in 1993, they decided to put uh, things started changing. The Cold War started becoming warmer. It did not become really. The war started to ease down, and People said, let's have not war, let's have peace, let's start showing a little, uh, no, we have to, let's start moving towards collaboration to each other. So the first ISS was built, no, not exactly ISS, uh, there was an ar agreement between the US and the Russians that they would say that to show our friendship and our mutual agreement for space exploration, why not we link two units, one from Russia, one from the US. And in space, that's what they did. They linked in the Mir 2 and the Freedom Project. They made, bring, brought it together, and that was the beginning of the International Space Station. Since then, International Space Station, they have been adding module after module after module. All they tell the people that are building their modules is that for you to link it, it must have these specifications to lock in. That's all they have to do. Uh, I don't know how many modules are there right now, okay? But right now, it's easiest to say that it is the largest structure in space. It is the longest standing right now. It already broke the record of uh, of uh, Mir, okay? Uh, it is the longest structure to be inhabited in space. It's in 2010. It had that record already in 2010, so 1993 to 2010. It's now a research facility for biology, astronomy, physics, and meteorology, and so on and so forth. You know? All these things. You know? Of course, it's also a facility for some people to do R&R. &R, you know? I'll get to that later. You know? So there's a new beginning. This is a new international space station. The world, the world now wants to be mutually uh, working together or working towards collaboration. Next. Now, when you think about it, when you stop to think about it, you ask yourself, what is the sustainability of a space program? You know? 
The reality is this. A space program is something that deals cost. It doesn't bring in any profit inside. So every government that spends on it loses money. The only thing they gain is knowledge, research, but there is no, not much development or not much applications. Okay? Maybe the applications in other fields such as, for example, the development of the Velcro was something that was made for space use. Now it's being used for our application here. Okay? Like the development of, uh, I've heard like uh, these uh, fluorescent lamps were also through here. No? There are technologies that trickle, trickle down. The use of, uh, how do you call it, material engineering developed because of, uh, because of a space program. Those develop, no? but there was no direct development, uh, no, nothing going back to the government because it would always be something that they would spend in. So, in the last decade, in the last decade, uh, since, 19, since 2000, government priorities have changed already. Okay? USSR has collapsed, where it had several countries, which include Ukraine. Uh, I forgot the other name of the country, but Ukraine was one of them before. That they were, that was separated, and the USSR is just known as Russia. No? Okay? Uh, there was a time when U.S. was in, in war in Middle East, so they had to divert most of their funds into war, rather into the space program. NASA had two major accidents wherein their shuttles blew up in space. The names of the shuttles were Challenger in 1986, and the other one is Columbia in 2003. No? That's why right now they had to retire almost all their uh, space shuttles already. No? They know U.S. has no space shuttles right now. No? The last one that flew was back in 2013. No? Okay, so it is costly to fund a launch. On the average, think about this: it would cost you twenty thousand dollars per kilogram just to send just to send one thing to the moon. Twenty thousand dollars per kilogram. Just to send something to the moon. Huh? That includes your payload and everything. Okay? So it's really, really costly. No? Okay? Next establish now, I'll tell you guys that we are living in interesting times already. No? That there is now a change in the kind of space age that we are going to face in. No? Uh, so basically, it's a new era of space age. The old era is basically what we know it to be. It's all about government support, sponsored. It was done primarily by the governments or the countries to establish their power, to establish prestige, to establish their rights. Like the U.S. has their rights over the moon. No? R&D development was mainly only for science, but it can be of, without any direction. Okay? Uh, anyone who wanted to go to space needed to have rigorous training. Whether to be called a cost, uh, uh, cosmonaut or an astronaut, no, they had to go under rigorous training. You had to be military trained. And then, the only thing what the private sector would be doing there is that they would bid in and contribute their work into whatever they're trying to build in. No? Okay? Nowadays, the new era will be this. No? Private companies now are going to lead the way. We will expect a lot of private companies that are trying to lead the way. I will name a few in the next few slides. It is now driven by entrepreneurs and real rich business people already. Okay? R&D, most R&D now is now focused towards commercial gains, towards whatever project that they are doing already. Okay? So privates now, private citizens can now pay their way to get to go to space or live in space. If you had the money, if you have the money, you can pay your way to go to space. What the price is, I will show tell you what the price will be. And the government now will just have to work in collaboration with them. You see the shift now? Instead of government leading the way, this time we're looking now at private individuals who will now take lead the way now. Private enterprises rather. No? Okay? 
So the next slide. The question is that how do we get up there? The fact is this. There is a market for people wanting to go to space. There is a market. There is a market. I guess you yourself, if you knew, if you could afford it, you would say that, yes, I want to go to space. Every single one of you here would like to go to space. No? Now, the other facts I will tell you is that there are governments willing to supply that market at the right price. Okay? And there are entrepreneurs willing to supply that market at a fraction of that price. Okay? Those are the existing things. Let me take example. There are two examples I will tell you. I don't know. One of them, I think the most well-known thing among us Filipinos here, I think it was also the TV commercial, was the Axe Challenge. No? So, did anyone try to apply to join the Axe Challenge <laughs> among you guys? To, to become a, the opportunity to become a space, uh, to be an astronaut, to join them. Nonetheless, when we talk about the Axe Challenge, no, there is a fact that we can always we can just establish the fact that there are people who are interested to go to outer space. There is an enterprise that was willing to spend for their marketing cost to send someone to space. That was one thing. So there is a market, that's one thing. The second one I want to also tell you uh, to, to, to think about is the, it's not seen there, uh, there is a website called Space Adventures. www.spaceadventures.com no? Now if you're a private individual, and you want someone to work here, work here and help you get their space flight, you just probably have to provide yourself with about $45 million to go there. No? To go to outer space. $45 million. They can make arrangements for you. There have been already about five individuals, five or six individuals, who have paid their way to go up there already. No? And I think the next one is in, I heard this Sarah Brightman. A singer from the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, next year, she's going to go out to outer space, right? No? So you know, no? she's the first artist, uh, artist who will go to outer space. No? Okay. Next slide. The most talked about town, talk about thing right now is about space elevators. So the concept is you anchor in your base on Earth somewhere at sea. In this case, it's in the North Pole, but somewhere at sea where you have a base station and you put an anchor in outer space where it will be geostationary which is probably about 36,000 kilometers away from Earth no? up directly up above you where it's, it will move around it will move along with Earth and all you do is that you have this cable that will bring you up and down but that concept there uh, it's been talked about in the last five years. No? Uh, the only problem with this concept right now is that, or basically the two problems is that we don't have a material yet that is strong and light enough to carry loads. And there isn't, uh, nobody has yet been able to manufacture 36,000 kilometers long of that material yet. But that has been the talk of the town in the last five years, space elevators. This is not something that is possible. Although the Japanese are working hard on this, and they say by 2050, 2050, 20, 2050, this will be a reality. Uh, we'll have to wait for that when that comes in. And hopefully you'll be there to see it. No? <laughs> Next. But going to reality, this, uh, the one that's most famous right now is Virgin Galactic. And the concept here of Virgin Galactic is that it's a two-stage airplane system. Wherein you have first an airplane that will lift your ship up into space. Like that. And basically drop off the tail. This is the tail end. They say that you will be rocketed into outer space. 
Okay? You can rocket into outer space, and this is the view that you probably see at the back. No? Now, you spend about a few minutes in outer space in weightlessness. The capacity of this ship is about six people, okay? Excluding, I think, excluding the pilots. You have the opportunity to take off your seat belts and float in outer space and look through the view of Earth. Uh, okay? And then after that, you will glide down back to Earth gently. No? Okay? So, this is the tail end. Let's just finish this so you have an idea. You have a few view of how it means that what they're offering here. Now, if you notice the tail end is moving up already, uh, so basically means that it's now going to drift down. So it's going to go down like that, but the tails, the rudders, the tail rudders are now coming down with it down. Okay? Okay. So this is a new technology already. They have this is this is a copy. You can find this in YouTube. This is a something that they. This is their second test flight image. They have done a third test flight. And they're expected to be in commercial. Uh, they're, they're expected to be already in commercial, commercially available already by supposed to be this year, if not this year, next year. In fact, it's easy to tell you uh, as of last year, based on the date, date and uh, it's based on what information we gathered. Uh, there already has been 600 people waiting in line. Already, who has reserved to go up there? Uh, you can include Justin Bieber as one of them who has paid his way up there. You put in a down payment. You have to put in a down payment of twenty thousand dollars. Okay, that's down payment. The actual cost for this experience for them, what they're asking for, is actually at at least two hundred thousand dollars. So this is two hundred thousand dollars. Or in Philippine pesos, you can say that's about 10 million pesos, okay, for this experience. No? Okay, next slide. If you want something cheap, cheaper, ah, uh, sorry, no? If you want something cheaper, although it's not already, already developed, they have come up with, there's another company named Xcore. No? Xcore, what they've done, they're also some, they're, they, they have developed a two-seater plane, okay, or two-seater space shuttle, where you will take off from the ground and shoot directly up to outer space, and then you land, and then you will be able to control yourself out there for a while, fly out for a while, and then you land back or glide back to Earth. Okay, that's just one ship. No? The price tag for that ship, for that ride, is either ninety-five thousand to hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's a lot, no? Problem is, is that they haven't done their test launches yet, no? okay? And they're expected to be out already. They're expected to be out flying maybe in 2016. Okay, no? so that's a concept. You can go to its website and it can see, this is it's from one of its websites. It says there, you can now purchase a ticket to aboard, the, to space aboard the Lynx. That's the name of their ship, okay? For hundred thousand dollars. Actually, there are two ships: the Lynx One and the Lynx Two. The Lynx One will cost you ninety-five thousand. The Lynx Two will be about hundred thousand. Okay. So, if you're interested to fly, want to learn? This is one of them. On a cheaper scale, next slide. No? On the cheaper scale, I just saw this initially, uh, just recently. There is this company called Worldview. Now, its concept instead of using uh, jet thrusters and all these jet, jet rockets, all these things. What it does now, it uses a balloon, and a very, very large balloon, no? that will lift you up into outer space. No? Outer space. It will lift you up to outer space. No? Well, there's some music that goes along with it, but uh, I can't put it there together. No? Okay, so it's a one giant balloon. No? Now it'll take you almost to the tip of the stratosphere and eventually release you and you will just parachute back to Earth. 
uh, they, they did their test. They did their test already recently, no? And it has been a success. I think two months ago they did a test, and then they, they said that the, uh, they made a scale model one tenth the size of that, and the results they said was promising. Uh, just yesterday or the other day, I just saw over the internet that this uh, not, that this techno uh, that they, this company has now gotten the approval of the uh, FAA for Federation of Air, Air uh, Airspace Administration, no? okay, to fly. No? They have already gotten the go signal. They have gotten the certificate, no? okay. So this one seems to be close. I mean, it's, a, it's very possible already. We expect to see this to happen soon. No? Okay? Maybe in another two, three years time. Okay. So the idea is to be back, land back down to earth. I hope you land back. My only com comment about this: I hope you land back where you took off or near that area. I don't know how you're gonna land back. How do you control yourself landing through a parachute coming down? Okay. So that's world view. No? Price tag is about seventy-five thousand dollars. Cheaper than, no? Okay, niya, no? Kaya niya, no? Worth more, mas kaya niya, no? Okay. Next, of course, the next concept now. The first concept was getting out there. This next concept is basically, what do you do to get out there? No? Oh, by the way, I missed out a while, a while ago. Uh, if you're not, if you're really eager to go out to outer space and live in ISS, in the International Space Station, uh, the only country that you can go to and who is willing to accept your money to go for you to go to outer space is Russia. Okay? You have to pay them $30 million just to go to outer space. And as I said earlier, there have been already at least five individuals who have paid themselves to do that. No? One of them, I remember, is a guy who is the owner, who is the, uh, what do you call this? One who is providing the free software, free operating system, Ubuntu. No? Mark Shuttleworth. No? Another guy who's been up there is a guy who was... Uh, the, the founder of Circus de Soleil. No? Circus de Soleil. No? Okay? He's done that already. I think there's a guy from Microsoft Yata who's done it also. No? So I'm not sure anymore. But there are about five already who's done it. No? So you pay Russia $30 million and you can get your flight up there. Now, if you look at this, $30 million against the cheap, the most expensive there is $200,000. That's still cheap. That's much cheaper than $33 million. No? Except that, at the end of the day, to all of us, it's still astronomical in value. Okay? If that's not enough, no? living in a space hotel is the next concept. That instead of taking your vacation in Boracay, or if you want to go to Phuket, or whatever beach that you want to go into, why not spend it in space? No? The concepts are there. One is saying that on the left side, you see what they do is they bring up a module to outer space and then inflate it so you have more room in there. No? It's a balloon capsule. The others are basically showing the capsules, the concept capsules, and then the space station, which will be used also as a place to, uh, for your, uh, how do you call that? For as an emergency place to hide in case, as an emergency getaway in case there's an emergency in the ISS or any other station. Okay? Next. No? Now, before I move on, there's actually, I have actually a, a, a video there that I'd like you to see, listen to. But before I move on, if you think that's impossible, there are just two things I want, there are two technologies I want to share with you that I came across recently. The first one is this. It says there, weird crystal can absorb all the oxygen in the room and then release it later. What does this mean in terms of technology? If this technology 
can be accept can be done already, it would mean that we could now store oxygen instead of a large tank, we can now shrink it down to a small smaller space. If we can store oxygen in a cubic foot or in a bottle in powder form, that might be a lot better and a lot cheaper to transport to outer space. Then they also say that this oxygen, if you expose it to heat, it will release the oxygen to you. Right now, the only way how they produce oxygen in the, how do you call that, uh, in the space stations is through ele electrolysis. Water is, you put current into water so that it will, uh, it will create, split the atoms, hydrogen and oxygen, and you'll have oxygen in your, uh, in your space station. But this technology, if this is really true, it would mean that it will make space and uh, space travel cheaper, bring supplies into space cheaper. Okay. And next one, the other next, the next technology would be interesting too. Is that we came across this coming soon? Filipino food in space. The concept is that you, they are trying to cook food in outer space. Food that you eat in outer space is basically mostly frozen or dehydrated. Here's the opportunity to cook food in outer space already. And it's you know, one of the Filipino that's actually leading that program, or working in that program at least, no? Okay? So you can see that. They're now being, finding a way how to cook food in outer space. That if you go to outer space and live in a hotel, you can now have warm food, no? Okay, I won't stay too long. Uh, let me pass the mic down to the computer so that you can hear what they're gonna say on the next slide. No? It's a video. Go ahead. speakers too little too too weak to hear anything but basically here it is it's now being how do you call that being promoted a space hotel is being promoted and you are going to be invite they're inviting people to go to go to space and eat there and they're trying to say that it's very luxurious you will have your own shower you'll be more spacious and uh, and of course going there you have the best view in the world the price tag that you have to pay, though, is at about sixty million dollars. No? Sixty million dollars at the end of the day. No? So it's interesting to see that. No? And this guy here is supposed to be the first space tourist to be going up to experience that. Okay, so he's being trained to go up to outer space. No? All right, next slide, please. No? So, uh, just about to finish it, space tourism. Our space explore and our space travel is now having its change now. As I said earlier, it's becoming more commercial now. Uh, the private in, private enterprises are now getting into this, and because of this thing uh, and the technology now trickling down, it's becoming more and more for the masses now. No? Maybe it will not be as cheap as what we think it will be right now, but maybe in the future 
like as it becomes as many many more competitors come in prices will come down okay but for now instead of one traveling to get the view like this they have mount mayon they have mount banahaw and mount uh, bulag up there in a beach beach front no i guess what they want you know, people are now willing to pay the price things like this no? that people are now willing to pay the price already to have a view of the view, view of the earth that i need no? So I end you with this, uh, maybe as a something to to give you some interest that one day you will be able to afford to go and take a space travel and stay in a space hotel and see this view from your window. Okay, so I end you with that. Thank you very much. Let's consider the space in Karma Line and Power Lord. So, kahit sino pumunta roon, pwede mo i-claim na nasa space ka na. Pero itong mga sasakay na to, lalagpas nga sila sa Carmen Line. Uh, nandun sila sa capsule nila, magpo-float lang sila doon. Pero hindi sila nakasuot ng space. So, hindi ka tulad ng, ano nga, misleading nga yung commercial advertisement ng uh, apps. Na nakasuot ng astronaut, naka-space suit siya, naka-space helmet, meron, back, meron pa siyang oxygen tank sa likod. Hindi ganun ang gagawin nila. So, meron lang silang su special suit, ng pressurized suit. Uh, tapos meron silang maliit na helmet na. Pero, sandali lang sila, less than 10 minutes lang sila sa space, nalulutang, tapos mapalik na yun. Kaya mura lang. Mga, pinakamahal lang yung $100,000. Uh, may, uh, meron pala $200,000. Yun ang mga, uh, example na may kay Sarah Brightman, yun yung sa Russia sila nagbabayad. So, she'll be paying 20 to 30 million US dollars sa Russia. Tapos, dadalhin siya sa International Space Station and she will stay there for several days. Yun. So, depende nga sa schedule ng mga astronauts ng capsule nila. So, yun yung talagang nandun sila sa space talaga. Imagine nyo, sa isang araw, ang space station ng ISS, ay patutun sa Pasha Sotong to. Ito yung sa, sa JAXA kasi. Uh, ang space shot, ang um, ISS, umiikot sa Earth every 19 minutes. Nakikita natin yun, dumadaan yun sa atin. May time na nakikita natin after sunset or before sunrise. So, ibig sabihin, sa isang araw, within 24 hours, merong nakakaikot sila ng mga 19 times sa, sa Earth. So, yun yung matagal talaga, talaga nasa space. So, i-clarify lang natin, magkaiba talaga yung space tourism na pupunta lang sa space for several minutes, tapos babalik na. So, mas mahal naman yung, yung mag-stay ka talaga dun sa ISS. Ang Russia kasi kailangan nila ng pera, ng funding. So, tumatanggap sila. Pero, hindi ibig sabihin, pag nandun ka na sa ISS, pwede ka makialam. Limited din yung galaw niya. So, merong area ka lang na restricted ka, hindi ka pwede rin. May area na doon ka lang pwede mag-stay. So, para mas clear. And, meron pang isa. Before Edmund adds in uh, sa other thoughts na din. Yes, it is suborbital only. But, take note. This is where it has to begin. It starts with small steps. So from here, if we're able now to have a commercial business that is at suborbital, what stops it now from somebody saying that let's take it one step further, let's take it to ISS, stay in ISS, what stops it from saying that why don't we have another uh, a, 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 pro, a, a package that would uh, turn you to the moon and so on and so forth. It will also come to a point that they will say that why not land on the moon? So we'll see that coming in the next few, probably dec 20 years, 30 years in the coming years. No? Maybe in your lifetime you will see it. No? Okay. Oh. Edmund? Uh, may any question? Sayang naman, baka mamaya paglabas natin, magtatanong kayo. Hindi, <laughs> <laughs> para, para kung meron pang, meron ba kayo gusto maintindihan? Uh, yung pinakamurang uh, ano niya, ticket niya is 130,000 Philippine Peso yun. Sasakay ka sa plano. So bakit sinabi nila zero G? Yung tawag ang tawag nila yung zero G. Kasi ha, you feel like in zero gravity. But technically, yung aeroplano kasi sasakyan, sarado, walang bintana. So yung nasa loob lang, parang ito, kung bakit itong auditorium nito, eh, biglang bumagsak tong building. Halimbawa lang, lulutang lahat tayo. Oo. Three-fold lang yun. Pero actually, yung aeroplano, parabolic lang yun. Nag-dive siya for about 10-15 seconds. 
mga fourth. Tapos, angat ulit. Pag umangat siya ulit, may gravity na naman. At sasabihin na naman ulit, magdatay mo ulit. Pag may... Kaya lang, ang feeling natin, zero gravity. Kasi, yung perspective mo sarado eh. Wala ka nakikita falling and going up. So, di na daya. Parang sumasakay kayo ng ano, ng... Yung, ano yun? Yung sa ride na Viking na yun? Ang course away? Yun. Ang pipilihin nyo, kung gusto nyo maramdaman nyo, doon mo sa likod. Huwag doon sa unahan. Yung nasa likod, yun ang mas malakas ang, ang mararamdaman mo na iiwan yung... Ganun nyo. Pero, hindi rin tama yung term na zero G. No? Tawag lang zero G, pero sa totoo lang, sa, may gravity pa rin. May gravity pa rin. Ang, ang ano lang, yung idea lang kasi na inaalis sa'yo, yung feeling mo, weightlessness. Ganun din sa space. Hindi natin dapat tawagin na pag nasa outer space ka, nagbubulutang yung mga astronauts, zero, zero, G, zero G na nararamdaman nila. Microgravity pa rin yun. Kasi kung sasabihin natin zero gravity na, eh bakit nandiyan pa rin yung moon? Diba? So may gravity pa rin. Pero hindi talaga zero gravity. So ikukorek lang natin. We, we always use the term zero G, pero hindi tama yun. So ikorek lang natin na meron pa rin microgravity. So, hindi talaga maaalis yung gravity. Kahit saan sa space, may microgravity. Kasi, bakit ang mga planets umiikot sa sun? Kasi may gravity. So, alisin mo lahat. Pag inalis natin yung sun, wala na. Kanya-kanyang galaw na yung mga planets. Kasi wala na yung pinaka-nagpupul ng gravity. Okay? So, yun lang. Baka para at least maitindihan ninyo. Malinaw na ba yan? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Edmund Rosales.